everyone. Welcome back to Pain Points. I'm Dr. Jay Kaler, and today we're going to be talking about targeted drug delivery, aka the pain pump. Um, I'm an interventional pain physician based out of Austin, Texas, and the goal of these sessions is really to educate patients, to, to give you guys the tools to be uh, informed in terms of making medical decisions about your pain care, and, and really to understand the basics uh, of, of, of pain medicine and why we do what we do. Um, I, I specialize in advanced therapies as well as neuromodulation. That includes uh, things like targeted drug delivery, which we're talking about today, as well as spinal cord stimulation, if you've been here for the last few episodes. Um, and, and really, we want you to be able to advocate both for yourself as well as your loved ones if you are considering a therapy like this or if you already have one. That we're going to be doing today is really focused about delivering, focused about delivering. Uh, as always, this is an interactive session, so if you have questions now or afterwards, uh, please uh, put them in the comments, post them on YouTube or Facebook, and I will comment on them. I know a couple patients or a couple people have left comments on the last one. I apologize. I was sick this week with, um, uh, with, with strep throat for my son, so unfortunately, I, I had to cancel some uh, my, my entire day yesterday. Um, but otherwise, we're back on track, we're moving forward. And uh, so join us today as we talk about this. So welcome. So today we're talking about what is a pain pump? Most of the time you think about pain pumps, you think about that IV pole and a pump pumping drug into the patient. Um, so that is not what this is. This is something very, very different. Who is a candidate for a pain pump? Um, there, are, we always think about with our therapies, who is who are who are our patients who are high responders, who are low responders? So we'll we'll dive into that a little bit today. What's the evidence for targeted drug delivery? Now there's a lot of things that this this therapy is called. It's called targeted drug delivery, it's called intrathecal drug delivery, it's called the pain pump. So what is the evidence for it? Is there evidence at all? Um, and then what's the process? What does it look like? We know with spinal cord stimulation, which we dove into uh, the last four sessions before our kyphoplasty talk last time. Um, there's a trial. Is there a trial for a pain pump? Short answer is yes. So let's let's look at all of these things and see what we can figure out here. So what is a pain pump? Most of the time you see this, this is a stock image of someone in a hospital and uh, they're getting medicines through an IV. And this is generally when we talk about a pain pump that people think about. They're thinking, okay, or, doctor, are you going to put an IV in me and pump medicines into me? Or you, is this an external thing that is pumping medicines into me? And the short answer is no, absolutely not. This is not what a pain pump is. Uh, a pain pump is, is actually uh, an extremely amazing piece of equipment. But in order to get there, I actually want to talk about medicine in general. And so I want to talk about if we were to take a medicine, what, what really happens? Um, and, and what are the reasons that things like opioids fail long-term for patients? Um, and so if we take a pill, we, that goes in our mouth, we swallow it with some water, it goes down um, into our stomach and it's broken down there. Uh, from there, it, it goes, uh, it's absorbed into the bloodstream and then undergoes first pass metabolism in the liver. And what that means is some of that medicine is extracted, it might be activated, it depends on the, on the drug. And then that medicine actually dissolves into the bloodstream. So you take this tablet that's extremely concentrated and you're basically going to say, you know what, I'm going to throw away part of it and it's going to undergo metabolism and then it's going to dissolve into our bloodstream into this really low concentration where then it has to make its way in this fourth part to get to where it, where it needs to go um, and, and where it works. So the question is, what are we doing with the rest of this drug? If 1% if of the drug, for example, is reaching where it needs to go, well, what are we doing with the other 99%? Well, we're, we develop things like side effects of the drug. We develop things like uh, intolerance. Um, there's other, other off-target effects. Constipation with opioids is a huge one that I see all the time. Um, so there are, there are a number of off-target effects as they affect these centers that really aren't pain centers in our brain or our nervous system, but they're more um, sensitive to things like opioids or some of our off-target medications. And this is really the challenge when I talk to patients about a targeted problem, this is the challenge of using a systemic medication to treating a targeted problem. And this is one of the things I love about our approach to pain is we are trying to use 
targeted approaches to targeted problems. And you, if you've if you've followed any of the other talks that we've had here, um, and I know you do because I talk to patients about this all the time, and they say, "I promise it's not a shot, Doctor Kaler. It's an injection." And that's true. It's a targeted injection. It's a targeted approach uh, to a targeted problem, uh, to a very specific problem. And that's that's really the challenge of using medications systemically to treat that. And targeted drug delivery is just that. It's targeted. And that's what we're going to go through here. So where do pain medications work? Um, there's actually some areas in the brain that they work, and there's some areas in the spinal cord. So on the left, we see a brain, um, and there's two places within the brain that they work. The first is the ventral tegmental area, and this is associated with the dopamine reward system. So that's feeling good. And this is what I talk to, talk to patients about. They say, what's the difference between a pain pump and taking medications by mouth? Well, you take medications by mouth, and that medication dissolves into the bloodstream. It goes into the brain, and you feel, ah, you feel relief. You feel so much better. And that's that's that ah factor. That's that I feel like I'm doing better factor, as opposed to when we use targeted drug delivery, there's just an absence of pain. And that's because it doesn't activate those pathways. So that's the first place it works in the brain is the ventral tegmental area. And the other area is the para, periaqueductal gray. And that's an, that's an area of the uh, brain where it communicates with the spinal cord to activate other, other aspects of analgesic benefit. So it affects the brain. And the other area it affects is in the spinal cord. Now, one of the things that we know about drugs is that when we use medicines long term, our body, let's say we have a, a receptor, a drug comes and binds to that receptor, and that sends a signal to our brain or to our brain for, for relief of pain, for example. Now, if we have a receptor and that drug is binding over and over and over and over again, or let's say it's just constantly occupied, over time, our brain is smart and says, hmm, that's not supposed to be happening. And, and, and what we do is we actually internalize and delete that receptor. We downregulate it. And this is an importance, and it's one of the things that we talk about when we talk about tolerance and habituation to medications where we have to use increasing doses to get the same effect. This is one of the reasons for that. We get desensitization. Our receptors are no longer sensitive to these medications. And they can both be both short-term and long-term. So this is one of the challenges I face every day when we talk about pain medicines specifically. And one of the reasons I'm not a big fan of using a lot of systemic medicines, especially for targeted problems. And so one of the one of the one of the things that we talk about when we talk about why pain medicines stop working is that it is that entire processes of our body deleting receptors of our body down regulating them so they're not there in the brain um, but like i said there's two places that that these medicines work they work both in the brain and they work in the spinal cord and so you guys have seen lots of pain pathways when i did our pain 101 talk way back at the beginning of this journey where we said okay a pain signal comes from my finger, it's going to go to my spinal cord. In the spinal cord, that, that, that pain signal is going to synapse or it's going to connect to another neuron and that neuron is going to send a pain signal to my brain. Well, pain, uh, uh, pain medicines like opioids can work in the brain or they can work in the spinal cord. They can work other places too, but these are the two primary areas, at least when we talk about brain pain transmission. And so long-term, um, one of the things that happens is over time we get habituation in the brain and we get, we get this problem with the dopamine reward system where it doesn't function correctly. But if we were able to apply medicine to the spinal cord without it affecting the brain in the same way, then we can get long-term pain relief. And that was really the hypothesis when this all came out. Are we able to give targeted medications to the areas that need it without causing all these other problems like constipation or itching or uh, dizziness or uh, kind of changes in our ability to, uh, to walk and stand up straight. I mean, these are all problems. These, these medications do have long-term complications, especially when we talk about the reward pathways that we have built into our brain. Those are innate features of our brain. So why do pain medications stop working? And it's, it's this thing up here. Okay, that's why we're talking about using intrathecal drug delivery, targeted drug delivery to give long-lasting pain relief to patients.
So what intrathecal drug delivery is, is a pain pump that's implanted under the skin. And this is, this is, you know, patients like, okay, is this just like you put it in there and then it's just going to kind of run. No, this is, this is probably one of the most advanced pieces of technology that we have. Because when you think about spinal cord stimulation, okay, you have all these electrical parameters that we're sending into the spinal cord, but a pump has to deliver an, an actual medication into the spinal cord. And it has to deliver that medication with exquisite precision. Because if it's wrong, it's a big problem. It has to be able to withstand things like electromagnetic interference. And this is one of the things patients can have MRIs with this pain pump. So it, it has to be that good. And that's, that's something that I think is really, really cool about what a pain pump is. So a pain pump is a, is a very simplistic term to talk about targeted drug delivery, the delivery of very specific amounts of medications at a specific location to the specific neurons of the spinal cord where the pain signals are being processed. The other thing that's interesting about the pain pump is patients say, well, isn't it going to just the medicine's going to leak out of my spinal cord and I'm going to get the same problem? And the answer is no. With When we look at how water soluble these medications are, they actually stay within the spinal cord and we know they actually don't travel too far. The other thing that's quite cool is, let's say you take a milligram of hydrocodone. Everyone's probably had five milligrams of hydrocodone or 10 milligrams of hydrocodone after a surgery at some point. But if you take if you take one milligram of hydrocodone by mouth, would that be effective? And I, I pose this question to patients all the time. Would a milligram of hydrocodone be effective? And most of the time, patients are like, yeah, no, there's no way that would be effective. They're like, 10 milligrams isn't even effective. So why would a milligram be effective? Well, if I take that one milligram of hydrocodone and I put it onto the spinal cord, that would be like taking anywhere between three and 500 milligrams of hydrocodone. Would that be effective? Well, yeah, that would be effective, but it also probably kill you. And that's the that's the beauty of this is we can use extremely low targeted doses of medication to use the drug to its fullest extent. So we're not wasting that 99% of it and having these off-target side effects. We're able to use 1% of that medicine, but get 99% of the efficacy. And that's really what targeted drug delivery is for our patients, is an excellent targeted option. And this truly is, it's not just like blasting the spinal cord with pain medicines. The location of where we put the catheter tip that delivers the medication is extremely important. And the, I, to highlight this, I want to show you the difference. When we, when we do a test, so, you know, to, to really um, unveil everything up front, yes, there's a trial. You get a, we do a single injection where we put some medicine in the spinal cord to see if it works. When we do that, we give about a milliliter of medicine. That's a very small amount, um, but we, we give about a milliliter of medicine and we see if that works. Well, that medicine, as you can see on the left compared to the quarter, that's a big amount of that quarter face. Well, 0.1 of that is even smaller. When we look at the, at the amount of medications we deliver, we're using a fraction of each of these. We're using 0.048 milliliters. Now, it's different for every patient depending on the type of drug and what we're trying to accomplish. But that's one of the very, very cool things is we can use very, very targeted amounts of medicine to get profound pain relief. When we talk about who gets a pain pump and what what I consider to be my my home runs, um, th this is this is really for me. There's a lot of patients that um, maybe don't fit these boxes, um, but but these are these are the patients that I see and I say, okay, I actually think you would do quite well. Cancer pain uh, is is one that I that I I really love doing. Um, mechanical axial neck or low back pain, and that means arthritis. That means it hurts in my neck. It always hurts here. This is this is my spot. Um, or the same thing with the low back. Um, degenerative disc disease, patients with chronic abdominal pain, uh, post-herpetic neuralgia, so having having that uh, shingles pain is, is another one. Post-kyphoplasty pain syndrome, so you have vertebral compression fractures and you continue to have that severe pain. Um, uh, fusions, so if you've had cervical fusion and continue to have pain or have lumbar fusion of the back and, and continue to have pain. And then also patients that have complex regional pain syndrome that's been refractory or unresponsive to other therapies. Those are my other patients that actually do very, very well. And this is by no means an all-encompassing list, but it's it's definitely when I see patients and I say, okay, I, I think you would do well. This is, this, these are the type of patients that I'm I'm looking for. It, it's not a great therapy for 
whole body pain. But I, I think this is one of the things when I talk to patients, I say, you know, if I could get your neck or your low back, would that be better? If we could take your neck pain away, would that allow everything else to relax and you would do better? Uh, that These are the questions that I ask and say, you know, how significant would it be if, if your back pain went from a seven or an eight down to a two or a two out of three? Would you be functionally better? Or is it just that everything hurts? And in that situation, that maybe, maybe this isn't the best option for you. Um, this is one of the things when we talk about biomechanics, pain changes the way you walk, sit, stand, twist, lift. And if that's the case, we, what we really want to make sure that um, you know, we're, we're targeting our therapy to see what the primary pain generator is. When we look at our protocol, the way we do this is uh, we have evidence uh, not at six, not just out to six months, not just out to a year or eighteen months. I mean, we have we have evidence for years down the road that patients can be maintained on very low doses. Are very specific doses of medication and get profound pain relief. Where patients start at about a seven or an eight out of ten and end up between a two or a three out of ten, and we see that time and time again. Um, but that's because we follow a very very uh, specific protocol, um, and that's that's one of the things that's not just borne out in in literature with that's industry funded. We see that um, also in in literature for other low dose um, drug delivery systems as well. So what's the process for a pain pump? Well, uh, step one is the trial. So just like anything, we we put some test medicine in there and we see if you're if you get pain relief. Um, there's a couple ways to do this, and there's always arguments um, um, arguments amongst us pain physicians as to what's the best way to trial a patient. But but for me, I put some test medicine in there and we watch you for a little bit, and then we say okay. Now go test it out. Now go now go work hard and see what see how your pain is. This is this is one of the ways I love to do it because I don't have to sit there and ask you questions or watch you in the hospital for days on end. I, I want to go see if we do this and you go do your normal activities, is your pain gone? And that's a test we can repeat if we have to. Um, step two is once once we know it's good, then we then we go towards the implant. The most important thing though is like we were talking about earlier with the brain pain receptors and, and the spinal cord pain receptors, we got to let the brain pain receptors regenerate because you make opioids endogenously. So I need those to regenerate. So that's why we, we have that six week period where we're getting you off of pain medicine and it's not hard. It's not easy, but it is definitely worth it. And that's, that's something that is, is really critical. I talk to patients and they say, well, what am I going to do? And I have to say, you know what? I, I don't know. I don't have all the answers, but I do know if we can make it through, I know what the end looks like. And that is, that's, that's what we're trying to bridge patients to. So after the implant, then we fill up the pump. Um, that happens about two weeks after we put the implant in. And then step four is adjusting, adjusting the dose. And I always tell patients, you know, adjusting the dose, this is like flying a plane, right? We're trying to get that baseline pain. You're never going to be a zero, but we try to get that baseline pain to somewhere where you're like, oh yeah, I'm crushing it. This is good. This is a, this is a big difference for me. And that's just like any therapy. It's like getting a plane off the ground. We need to get to that cruising altitude. And yeah, there might be some turbulence along the way. Most of the time when we're talking about refractory pain, you've been through some turbulence. So that is what we're trying to do. We're trying to get through that turbulence and get to that smooth sailing. You're still going to have pain that goes up and down from there, right? But we're we're trying to get to that that level where this is a this is a manageable thing, and you're doing more. You're more active. And then on the right, you can see filling the pump up is actually quite easy. Um, it's just a needle that goes through the skin into the pump, and we fill it up with the drug. The goal is to fill this up about every three months, and we make some adju adjustments in the dosing and the concentration. During that first few months, we might be filling you up every two months. Um, until we can reconcentrate the medicine and get you spaced out to every three months, but that's the goal with it. Um, so this is this is pain pumps in a nutshell, and I'll take any questions or you can leave them in the comments. Um, but the wonderful thing about this therapy for our patients is that it gives us an ability to use targeted medications at, at a targeted uh, location, reduce the dose, decrease the side effects, and actually use a drug like an opioid and give you excellent excellent evidence-based response to the therapy. And at the end of the day, I think the thing that's most powerful about this is time and time again, if you look at the CDC guidelines for opioid prescribing, time and time again, it says right at the top, there is no evidence 
for opioids in the treatment of chronic pain when you take them by mouth. But time and time again, with, with intrathecal drug delivery, with targeted drug delivery, we are not able to prove that the patient can get excellent long-term pain relief, but also we can take those doses and reduce them drastically, but use them in a targeted manner where they are working more efficaciously for our patients. Thank you guys so much. I'll see you next week and uh, we'll go on from there.